the Felix Meridis, a place where in 66 hours, 89 talks and thousands of climbed steps, 634 people share their one passion, Blender. The Blender Conference 2024 was just as awesome, crazy and inspiring as ever before. But unlike the previous two conferences, this year wasn't all fun and games. This year I learned something that scared me a lot. It wouldn't be a proper beacon without a kickoff keynote by Blender's original founder and creator, Tan Rosendahl. Starting with some of this last year's highlights, like the extensions platform where you can get a ton of free add-ons, the new Grease Pencil 3 with big improvements under the hood, no tools, EV Next, and the first step into transitioning to Vulkan for rendering instead of OpenGL, which will be the next big step for the software and industry adaptation. But after a few minutes, Tan went on to his main and more controversial topic of this year's talk. Money. And I kid you not, this shook me to my core. Not because of the subject, but because of the numbers that he presented. Now as a bit of information, Blender relies solely on donations and sponsorships as it's not allowed to make profit for personal gain as per Dutch law. In total, the Blender Foundation currently stands to make around 3.2 million USD in 2024, which is insanely low considering the well over 20 million downloads per year and the estimated 2 to 4 million people that use Blender frequently. Now here's a question for you. How many people do you think donated to Blender either one time or monthly in the year 2023? The answer? 10,200 people in 2023 donating for Blender. That's crazy and honestly kind of scary to me. And to think that these 10,000 people and a handful of corporate contributions are essentially providing Blender to its millions of users is even more insane. Not only that, even if only several hundreds of people leave the dev fund, Blender might have to let people go, slowing down development or even grinding to a halt altogether. Now, I get that I might be talking from a point of privilege. For me, paying a monthly contribution to a free tool is something that I can afford, which it obviously isn't for everyone. But I'm 99.9% .9 sure that more than 10,000 people worldwide are able to pay some amount to Blender for this amazing tool. So I want to use my platform here to ask each and every one of you that is able to, to donate to Blender's continued existence. You can find a link to Blender's development fund page in the description, so please check that out. Day one had some absolutely great talks. The first one I'd like to highlight is a fun short watch by Jason Van Gumster titled Building a Career Around Blender. This talk contains valuable information on how to get started and take the plunge into using Blender to make a living. Jason goes over some very on the nose tips like get good or know your audience, but manages to explain these in a fun way, adding tips and experience from having used Blender for over 20 years and building a career around it himself. It also aligns perfectly with one of the main reasons I made this channel to help you all find a foothold in the industry and eventually being able to make a living with art and 3D. This is definitely a must watch from me. Next up, we have the animation of Flow, a talk by Sacre Bleu's animation director about a short film called Flow, which was made in Blender and actually just got added to the official selection at the world's most prestigious film festival, Cannes, or Cannes, I guess. Now, I'll be honest here, I would have loved to have seen some more stuff about the actual art direction and animation specifics for this film, but it was still a very informative talk showcasing perfectly what the workflow and pipelines look like for these types of productions. Stuff like asset managers, production trackers, improvement pipelines, animatics, animation references, and even the hiring process, which is quite informative for if you're looking to be hired into these types of projects. This might not always be the sexiest part of 3D and animation, but it's a super crucial one and something you can get around if you want to join this industry. So definitely check this one out to learn the ins and outs of how this project came together. Finally, on day one, we have something I didn't know could be so interesting, color management. It's a bit technical, but luckily Jacob Holiday, whom you might know from this truly amazing tutorial over on his YouTube channel in Light VFX, is the perfect teacher for this subject. In this 15 minute video, Jacob explains how color management works, or 
doesn't, I guess, going over how color inputs change from textures to interpretations within Blender to final render exports and how our screens and eyes then change it some more. Although the knowledge from this video doesn't necessarily change your final artworks with like a new amazing lighting tip, for example, it will teach you how and why color spaces are used in digital media, which in turn is good for understanding how your art will look to other people's eyes. And by that metric, it should definitely improve your art. And while we're on the subject of improving your art, Skillshare, the sponsor of this video, is an ideal place to learn Blender or tons of other useful skills that will help you do that. For example, the class Color Grading for Filmmaking Division Art and Science by Dan Dan Liu that goes over how to get color right and make your art or animations pop. Now this class applies to the free software DaVinci Resolve, which I definitely recommend for editing and color grading, but the same principles can be applied just as easy within Blender directly. Besides this class, Skillshare offers thousands of other classes and learning paths that can help you in any aspect of your creative work. Think of photography, music, graphic design, or even entrepreneurship. And on top of that, Skillshare has just updated their platform with smarter class categories, the ability to find classes by software and material, and interest-oriented recommendations tailored to your goals. To get you started, Skillshare is offering the first 500 people to use my link in the description, a one-month free trial. So sign up before they run out and get going today. Day two kicked off with a really inspiring talk and project by Thomas Cole, a technical artist who in his free time decided to accurately recreate the astounding Aztec capital city, Tenochtitlan, which we now know as Mexico City. Also, I probably butchered that name. In this video, Thomas goes over how he used geometry nodes for generating cityscapes, dividing it into segments of farmland or more urban scenes, terrain displacement, tree scattering tips, and even how to create a simple yet stunning water shader. Coming from the game industry, Thomas goes over a ton of smart optimization techniques which allowed him to recreate this ginormous scene at scale while still being able to edit it as the project evolved, which, since he spoke to tons of scientists who've studied the city, happened frequently. So, making sure things worked procedurally as much as possible allowed for quick iteration and changes without having to redo a bunch of the work. It's a really inspiring and great talk and absolutely one of my favorites this year. Before continuing on to the next talk, I'd like to give a quick mention to the talk Avalon's Quest, which once more showed how broad of a software Blender truly is. This 15-minute talk covers the development and progress of the Tufijo Avalon's Quest and how it's fully made using Blender's Grease Pencil. Quite remarkable and a great showcase for this part of Blender. Now next up we have a talk by Blender's resident node wizard, Simon Toms. Another nice and short watch on how the Blender Studio used grease pencil, geometry nodes, and a lot of different shading techniques to create the studio's latest project, Gold. This short film, which hasn't officially released yet, was the studio's latest project to push Blender's capabilities. Using a very unique painterly style, this asked a lot of the program, as well as from the studio's artists. Simon covers various techniques they used and how they approach the specific problems they faced in this project. It's really very interesting and it'll be great to see the final animation when it releases. Finally, on day two, I want to go over a more informational but still interesting talk namely the Blender Roadmap. In this video, Francesco and Sergey from the Blender team share some of the behind the scenes for Blender today, tomorrow, and in the more distant future. Some points you'd come to expect by now as we already have them today, like stability, compatibility from version to version, and completeness for the software as a whole with its tools and capabilities. And there's also interesting new steps that they are currently working on, like pipeline integration changes, especially around USD, which I believe could be a game changer for both studios and individual artists. And this is just the stuff that the team is working on right now. But there's also things which are expected soon, like certain AI tools to empower artists, story tools using Blender Sequencer allowing for seamless previous workflows, and character animation tools to allow for more modular and reusable usable animations, which ensure smaller teams can get more things done. And finally, the future, where things get a bit more abstract and ambitious. Blender's looking into doing more with the internet, allowing for collaborative work on the same scene, as well as looking at newer or different modeling methods like NURBS, SDF, and Gaussian splatting, of which I think SDF looks really, really cool and promising, as this allows you to work more freely and creatively and only worry about the topology in a later stage. 
but also Blender apps, for example, which allows people to make custom application experiences using Blender, like for example, this media viewer app made using Blender's framework or this model viewer that allows you to view models and apply materials. It's still very much in its infancy, but at some point this could allow for custom versions of Blender on, for example, a mobile device, which is a yeah, absolutely crazy idea. Now that wraps up day two, but luckily we have some of the best talks saved for day three. On the final day, Andrew Price or Blender Guru ruffled some feathers with his talk on Blender's UI. In this 20 minute presentation, Andrew goes over how the UI, according to surveys, is Blender's biggest weakness. And I couldn't agree more. Although I'm now quite well versed in Blender, I still understand about maybe 80% of the UI and things going on. And that's with over six years of experience under my belt. Now, Andrew expressed that when he runs into an issue after 20 years of usage, he basically goes over a standard mantra to see what the issue might be. And although this usually fixes things, it's not something beginners understand or know. And I've heard you guys say it too, right? Blender's UI is confusing. You say, I tried to do X, but Y is not happening like in your video, etc. Obviously, this isn't all Blender's fault. We humans make mistakes or misinterpret things. However, Blender could be more helpful in pointing out common issues or states that you might be facing. And this is exactly what Andrew is highlighting here with some great examples, like permanently marking flip normals, double vertices, or overlapping geometry, to name just a few. And he goes over how these could be fixed quite simply too. It's a very interesting topic and an issue that I wholeheartedly believe could be improved upon. So make sure to check out this video. And if you agree with some of the stuff that Andrew's saying, leave a comment on that video. So the folks over at Blender know that people agree or even have more ideas on how to improve the UI and UX. Now, the second talk I wanted to mention is probably my favorite of all the talks that I've seen this year. This presentation given by BAFTA winner Will Anderson is called Innovation in Character Creation, but should have been named something like having the best of times in Blender. It's the perfect example of what happened when you stop treating Blender as purely a work tool, but instead treat it as play. Will goes over his crazy, fun, and hilarious ways of creating characters, often using funny little sound effects, simple yet quite effective rigs, and facial mocap plugins. The results are not only hilarious and cute, but also effective and pragmatic, even while being so simple in their setup. I absolutely love how he forgets about the rules. No mention of proper topology, animation splining, reference, or any of the other laws of 3D creation. Just a hell of a lot of fun in Blender with only one goal in mind, creativity. This video for me is the embodiment of why using Blender is so incredibly fun. It really inspired me to start doing more play and less work inside of Blender and reconnect with this part of my creativity myself. Now, the final talk I want to highlight is another one by Francesco from the Blender team, and it ties back into the first part of this video. Francesco has been giving these Blender by the numbers talks every year, and they're always very interesting to watch. Mostly because it's great to see that Blender keeps growing steadily year on year, and the numbers go to show for that. Here's just to name a few. Blender is downloaded every three seconds. That means so far in this video, Blender has been downloaded almost 270 times already. And this number might even be higher as they have no way of tracking people who use app blockers, which are, I guess, the majority of people these days. Another fun fact is that every given point, there's around 10,000 users who are using Blender through Steam simultaneously. So that's not even including all the other users. That's just purely through Steam, which is kind of weird to think about that, you know, right now there's at least 10,000 people worldwide who are working in Blender. But there's also heartwarming data like the amount of developers working on Blender steadily growing or that 70% of all reported issues and resolutions are being solved within a week after they're posted and 100% gets a first response at least within the same week which is absolutely crazy in terms of, you know, the skill of this software. And it goes to show the dedicated and passionate community that Blender has crafted over the last 30 years. Now, finally, Francesco once more covers the donations coming in, highlighting the impact of the new donation UI changes and ease of use and the effect of their first tries at asking people to donate more often. So far, these have been doing great and the one time and monthly donations have risen, but we're not there yet. Blender could still make use of a lot more money. Remember, 
the more income Blender has, the faster and better development can be supported. So as a final wrap up for this video, please consider donating to Blender's Dev Fund not only for Blender's continued future, but also for a better product for yourself. Thank you to everyone who came up and said hello this year, and thank you Blender for hosting another great event. See you next year.